गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन वेलकम टू ऑल फॉर द लाइव वेबिनार फ्रॉम मॉडर्न आई टूडे टॉपिक इज क्लिनिकल एवेल्युएशन ऑफ द ऑप्टिक नर्व हेड इन ग्लाकोमा बाय डॉक्टर जी विष्णु तेजा हु इज ए मेडिकल कंसल्टेंट इन अरविंद हॉस्पिटल केनी now i request dr vishnu deja to talk to take over the proceedings further in the live webinar session vishnu am i audible sir yes at the outset i would like to thank dr priyal rao sir dr bharti madam dr gopal ji sir and all the experts of the modern group of eye hospitals for giving me this opportunity i wish a wonderful evening to all the respected senior ophthalmologists my colleagues post graduates and my dear friends today i'll be discussing on clinical evaluation of the optic nerve head in glaucoma i'll be discussing under the following headings introduction anatomy of the optic nerve head the five r's morphology of the optic nerve head and the morphology of the glaucomatous optic atrophy DDLS and the differential diagnosis. You know the glaucoma is a progressive, chronic progressive optic neuropathy, which is characterized by the optic nerve head changes and visual field loss, with IOP being the most common and modifiable risk factor. The term glaucosis, which means bluish green hue of the affected eye, dates back to 400 BC by the Greeks. Even Crypo, uh, Hippocrates. has mentioned this term in his writings this term was also applied to cataracts but later it it uh, this entity has been confined to glaucoma condition as such the clinical examination is very important in a way that the structural damage which we can see clinically occurs very significantly before the visual field loss which may happen early identification of this damage helps in initiating or intensifying the treatment relevant anatomy we know the optic nerve is composed of a neural uh, numerous number of neural fibers blood vessels glial cells and supporting tissues each optic nerve consists of 1.2 million nerve fibers the total number of fibers passing through the optic nerve head is related to the disc size the larger the disc the more number of fibers it contains and vice versa the average disc diameter is 1.5 mm and area 1.8 square mm the central lateral artery and the vein which enter or exit the eye at the center of the optic nerve divide within the surface of the optic nerve head the circumlinear vessels that see the central vessel trunk run towards the macula they lie superficial on the surface of the optic nerve head and they are supported by the rim tissue that is the edge of the cup so these will be lying closely uh, to the uh, along the margin of the cup Uh, coming to the optic nerve head zones, so this is the optic nerve head cross section. This is the vitreous surface, and uh, uh, these are zones are divided anatomically. This is the optic nerve head surface layer, the surface layer of the optic nerve head, and this is the prelaminar part, the retina and choroid part, and this is the laminar fibrosal part, which is also called as the called as the laminar part of the optic nerve, and is a retrolaminar part. Coming to the supports of the optic nerve head which is mostly the astroglial cells um these are present throughout the optic nerve mostly till the lamina cribrosal part uh, so these uh, glial cells in the astrocytes they are present not only on the surface but also among the bundles of the axons as well as separating them from the anatomical layers that is the choroid as well as the sclera if you see this is the vitreous surface this is the internal limiting membrane of elsnick which is continuous with the internal limiting membrane of the retina and it forms a central meniscus of cunt here and then the glial uh, the supporting tissue which is present next to the retina here it is called as the um intermediary tissue of cunt and next to the choroid is the border tissue of jacobi next to the sclera is the border tissue of elsnick this border tissue of elsnick is the one which uh, comes up to the surface of the optic nerve head as the anterior scleral scleral lip coming to the distribution of the nerve fibers the ganglion cells which gives their axons travel from 
all over the retinal surface up to the and then reach the optic nerve right? they have characteristic distribution like if you can see the temporal peripheral fibers which are there here they uh, arch above and below uh, away from the median raphe pass above and below the fovea to reach the optic nerve head here when they reach the optic nerve head they constitute the part of the neural rim there so any damage of the fibers here will be uh, reflected here as well as the damage here will be reflected in the area where it is coming from similar uh, likewise and uh, these uh, um, fibers are called as the superior and inferior arcuate fibers the axons or the bundle of axons in these areas when they approach near the optic disc they form larger visible bundles because of the lateral fusion of the bundles and they are visible clinically as the retinal striations which is a clinically a healthy sign and the fibers from the central retina which they are traverse uh, directly into the optic nerve right which constitutes the papillomacular bundle they go into the temporal part and the arcuate fibers they go into the superior temporal rim and as well as the infratemporal rim the nasal fibers as a superior arcuate fibers and inferior arcuate fibers they form the neural rim on the nasal side so the five hours in the evaluation of optic nerve head are the rim of the sclera which corresponds and which gives us an idea of the this size and shape the rim shape and area this is a neural retinal rim this indirectly gives us the size of the cup its shape and the neural retinal rim thickness the region of peripapillary atrophy the zones beta and alpha the retinal nerve fibers layer and then the retinal and disc hemorrhages these are all in this five hours fancy term nowadays is given by finger et al in 2005 now coming to the morphology of the optic nerve head here uh, we can see the normal disc which is vertically oval and uh, the scleral ring which corresponds uh, which gives us the idea of the disc margin is shown here which is seen as a thin even white rim and it's also an anterior extension of the sclera the tissue of elsmi and here if you see the yeah this is the disc uh, we can see the margin and the central part is the cup and the uh, uh, gap between the cup margin and the disc margin is called as the neuroretinal rim and uh, at this time i would like to say the glaucoma evaluation is mainly done with a slit lamp biomicroscopy using a condensing lens plus 90 adapters or a plus 70 adapters in a well dilated pupil we have to examine both eyes at the same time we have to document all the findings what have we see preferably drawings is better so that it will help us to uh, it will be helpful to monitor the findings in future how well it is progressing or if it is stable so when we want to assess the disc size we are using a slit lamp biomicroscopy uh, here we have used the 70 adapters lens so uh, the uh, illumination is the illumination is narrowed and then it is brought to the center over the disc and then the height also is decreased corresponding to the disc size at this time when it is uh, the illumination is just about the size of the disc we'll see the reading on the slit lamp reticule here it is 1.6 mm 1.6 mm so the correction factor for this 70 adapter is 1.2 which gives us an idea that the disc diameter in this case is 1.2 mm similarly uh, when we use other lenses like 90 adapters or a wide field lenses the correction factor differs like in this case even a direct ophthalmoscope can be used to uh, get an idea whether the disc is average in size smaller or larger by using a 5 mm a 5 degree aperture which will be illuminating 1.5 mm diameter of the uh, retina and when this one is uh, Uh, when this illumination is brought onto the disc, we'll get an idea. For example, in this case, the illu the illumination is more than the disc, which means the disc could be a smaller one. So, so in this way, we'll uh, grade the size of the disc as small, average, and large size. Coming to the cup, we know the cup is may. Uh, the vertical cup disc ratio is very important in glaucoma evaluation 
and uh, the margin of the cup which is very important it should be defined by its contour and uh, at the place where the blood vessels are kinking or bending for example here the vessels are bending here as well as here at this place and uh, similarly here these are both are uh, optics of the cmi both are normal and uh, so uh, likewise when we uh, determine the size of the cup it gives us an idea of the neuro retinal rim also the normal cup is horizontally oval in shape whereas the disc is vertically oval which gives the neuro retinal shape to be uh, thickest at the inferior then superior then nasal and temporal which is called as is in the rule i'll tell you later and uh, so the circumlinear vessels here which emanate from the main trunk vessels they pass along the margin of the cup these are the circumlinear vessels towards the macula so in glaucoma when the cup margin recedes away from the center we can observe the barring of the circumlinear vessels which i will tell you later in less than 5% of the health, healthy population the cup disc is more than 0.65 whereas in uh, more than 96% healthy subjects the cup disc asymmetry is less than 0.2 so we should be cautious when we are examining a large cup and then asymmetric cups in between the two eyes it's a logical neural rim so as i said when we determine the cup size we'll get an idea of the neural rim also and it's an uh, indirect uh, uh, assessment so the neural rim we can see it can be vary depending upon the disc size as as well as the cup size so um, in glaucoma evaluation more than the cup size the thickness of the neural retinal rim its color is very important uh, here there are various sizes of the disc all are normal and uh, the neural retinal rim typically follows the isnt rule which means this is the right eye disc the inferior rim is broadest followed by the superior followed by the nasal and then the temporal rim this was sign was uh, uh, first uh, described by eliot wernell and uh, coming to the physiologic peripapillary retina these are uh, when we want to study these we can be uh, it can be studied under the re uh, retinal nerve fiber layer rnfl where we can see striations as i told you in the distribution of nerve fibers we can see the superior arcuate fibers and inferior arcuate fibers glistening at the arcades striations these are more common inferior uh, these are well seen supratemporally infratemporally under white light it appears as whitish haze and it's best viewed with red free or green light and any abnormalities in the retinal nerve fiber layer as defects can be seen as slits or wedge shaped defects which we'll be discussing again in the later slides coming to the peripapillary pigment variations uh, uh, that scleral lip which i have already mentioned is surrounded by zone beta and alpha here this number 1 is the cup number 2 is the neural retinal rim and next to the neural retinal rim is the scleral lip and this is zone beta and zone alpha this zone beta is that area where there is retracted epithelium anatomically hypoplasia or atrophy of i'm sorry atrophy of choroid or absence of the choroid which exposes the underlying sclera so literally there are only nerve fiber layer and sclera which can be seen through that so this zone beta with the optic disc corresponds to the enlarged blind spot and also an absolute scotoma zone alpha on the other side if you see this dark blue sorry light blue here this is due to the increased pigmentation or heaping of the heaping up of the rp and they correspond to the relative scotoma or the decrease in the visual sensitivity around around the uh, blind spot and coming to the morphology of the glaucomatous optic atrophy the disc changes in glaucoma are typically progressive and or asymmetric various characteristic patterns are observed in glaucoma which can be studied under three categories like the disc patterns or focal or concentric atrophy uh, other things as well as the vascular signs and the peripapillary changes we'll be discussing all these in detail the disc patterns you see all the nerve fiber layers 
from all over the surface of the retina, they exit the eye through the scler scleral canal, uh, which forms the neural retinal rim here. Any loss of the axons leads to the damage or death of the ganglion nerve cells, which leads in the apoptosis of those axons, resulting in the thinning of the neural retinal rim at that point with corresponding visual field effects, which are seen at the places where the nerves are distributed to. Sir, I don't know why these lines are coming here. Thank you. Uh, so continuing here, focal atrophy. Uh, uh, I request uh, other people not to operate the slideshow. I'll take care of it. Focal atrophy. Can this uh, yellow line also be erased? Yellow line, please erase the yellow line. Vishnu, it could ever change it. That's not very clear. But this thing may do whatever. Fine, sir. But actually, I'm not doing anything here. Okay, yeah. Okay, sir. I'll proceed. So this focal atrophy uh, here, if you see the neural retinal limb loss inferiorly in this case. So this selective loss of neural retinal rim is more common in the poles like inferior temporal as well as superior temporal, which can be seen as the receding margin of the cup here. Receding margin of the cup here. Uh, so this leads to the loss of the retinal rim in that area. So this results in an enlargement of the cup in a vertical direction or oblique direction, results in a polar notching, also called focal notching or pit-like changes. So when this notching occurs in both the poles, it is called bipolar notching, as we see here. At that point, we can see the neural retinal rim is very thinned out and there can be associated retinal nerve fiber layer defects at that point, which we'll discuss again. So when this focal atrophy defect enlarges, it deepens, developing a sharp nasal margin, which is defined as the sharpened polar nasal edge, where the blood vessels just lie up, uh, along the margin of the cup, as in this case. And these retinal vessels crossing the sharpened rim, these vessels bend sharply to form the bionetting sign. If you see this, the bionetting, bionet here, and this is also described as the double angulation of the blood vessels. If you see clinically, this vessel is going this way and then it is bending and again it's going this straight way. So this is the bionetting sign. And uh, okay. another example we can see where uh, this one, when we see the, this should be normal. When you want to examine the cup, this appears to be the margin of the cup in superiorly, whereas the inferiorly, this appears to margin of the cup. So it's more like a 0.6 uh, vertical cup is uh, diameter uh, ratio. And uh, there is superior thinning of the neural retinal ring. So when there is superior uh, thinning of the superior NRR, these fibers are coming from the peripheral, peripheral uh, retinal fibers in the on the temporal side above the median drape. So they will give a corresponding vertical step, vertical nasal step. Uh, next disc pattern is the concentric atrophy. So uh, this concentric atrophy in, uh, on the contrast or contrary to the focal atrophy, the damage occurs in a uh, concentric manner where all the neuroretinal rim stings at the Consequently, I mean, uh, on the parallel side, leads, leading to the enlargement of cup. So the, lo the loss of neural retinal rim starts temporarily usually, and then it progresses circumferentially, like superiorly, and then inferiorly, and then the whole margin of the disc, which is commonly called as temporal unfolding. Other variant is the deepening of the cup. The predominant pattern in some cases, where the cup deepens, and as the cup deepens, so far the blood vessels which are lying on the floor of the cup, when the cup deepens, the, because of the loss of support to the blood vessels, they appear to be hanging. Uh, some describe it as hanging in the air. Uh, and then they appear to be bridging the 
uh, cup and later they may collapse into it. When they appear bridging the walls, I mean bridging the cup, they, it is called as overpass cupping. Lamina dot sign is termed when we can see the fenestry of the lamina here, which is the exposed uh, lamina cribrosal part, which uh, gives us an idea that uh, this is a this is a progressive case of glaucoma. Though lamina uh, lamina dot sign or the prominent fenestra can be seen in the uh, high myopes also. Paler cup discrepancy. So as I said. The cup should be the cup should be defined not only I mean not just by the color it should be sorry it should be defined by its uh, it should be defined based on the blood vessels at the margin so as the notching is I mean as well as the focal atrophy is progressing we can see a diffuse shallowing at the neural lateral limb at that part. It is shallow cup where there is still, still some amount of neural rim tissue available there. So it uh, it is seen in a normal color, which is uh, termed as the tinted hollow. And uh, later Krishna, it will sir. Krishna, one minute. Ni 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 monitor lo pencil tool ne disable jaise thava. Apun ne kalaiyans pota hai ne monitor me the. Sir, it's already disabled, sir. Okay then, yeah. Okay. Okay then, yeah, carry on, please. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, this saucerization is the diffuse shallow cupping which extends to disc margin. It most commonly occurs in infrotemporal quadrant and it's an early sign. Tinted hollow is a normal rim color. And uh, we should, uh, determining the margin of the cup should always not, should not be gone with just the color of the cup because even optic atrophy can give a false impression of these uh, findings. Advanced glucometers cupping, where there is almost loss of the, near total loss of the axonal fibers in untreated condition, leads to severe loss of neural rim tissue or thinning of the neuroretinal rim in all the quadrants, resulting in a total cupping, which is also called as pain pot cupping. In these cases, where the cup is very deep, we can witness the laminar dots or the Lamina fenestra very clearly. Uh, the vascular signs are the optic disc hemorrhages, which are also called trans hemorrhages. These are the splinter hemorrhages, which are present on the surface of the optic nerve head and on the uh, adjacent extrapapillary retina. So when we see such uh, uh, splinter hemorrhages, it can be an early sign of glaucoma, which can cause focal atrophy at that point if it's not there so far. Or when it's an already existing glaucoma, if we see a trans hemorrhage, it means that the glaucoma is very fast progressing, where we can see a corresponding notch and a retinal nerve fibrillate defect, as in this case. In which cases, we should be very cautious and the treatment can be very aggressive or we can intensify the treatment. So these, uh, these hemorrhages are transient. That means they come and go. And uh, they usually disappear first on the papillary side first, and then they disappear on the extra papillary area. They signify glaucomatous, uh, glaucomatous damage or rapid progression. They are, they are common in the normal tensile glaucomas and in glaucoma patients with diabetic mellitus uh, disease. The superior temporal and inferior temporal site is the common site of the optic disc hemorrhage. The, when we see a disc hemorrhage, uh, there is high possibility that there is an RNF, RNFL defect within two clock hours of its presence. It may predispose to focal atrophy, which could be the first sign of damage. So here, uh, a known case of glaucomatous damage, where the inferior limb is more thinned out than the superior, and now the disc hemorrhage has uh, occurred on the superior side of the superior uh, disc margin. Uh, so uh, the field effect will be like this, which corresponds to the inferior neuroretinal rim loss, which corresponds to a superior arcuate defect, as in this case, we can see superior arcuate defect, and also a nasal step. The other signs of retinal vessels are the collateral or shunts, or even optocellular shunts, which are seen in chronic cases of glaucoma. And as I discussed about overpass cupping, where the blood vessels bridge the margins of the cup. And the other sign is the barring of circumlinear vessels. Uh, which I showed in the initial slides, 
how the circumlinear vessels appear which are usually present along the margin of the cup as the supporting tissue is lost they the vessels are just barred or exposed from the margin of the cup these were described by hessler and osher and the other signs are the nasalization of the vessels where the retinal where the retinal vessels usually uh, the retinal vessels usually ride up along the nasal margin of the cup when the tissue is lost there these vessels rest on the nasal margin so they shift towards the nasal cup which is termed as nasalization and there are they can also be narrowing of the retinal arterioles generally peripapillary changes as i said nerve nerve fiber layer bunding defects where we can see striations or wedge shaped defects we have to uh, document how wide is the retinal nerve fiber layer defect and its location so in this case we can see the retinal nerve fiber layer defects or the absence of the normal retinal striations here which are witnessed as the dark zones so here if you see these blood vessels <coughs> appear more clear and bright than before because of the defects in the superficial retinal nerve fiber layer and there will be corresponding thinning of the neuroretinal rim neuroretinal rim bipolar nrr thinning or bipolar uh, focal atrophy is there here so this will gives uh, these in the red free photograph the defects are witnessed like this so if we do a field in this patient it is highly likely that the patient will have a double arcuate scotoma so this nerve fiber layer uh, this rnf defects may be associated with this hemorrhages and they correlate highly with the visual field changes this incidence is more in glaucoma than ocular hypertensive patients than the normal tensions so here as i said it's a inferior wedge shaped defect which corresponds to the superior arcuate scotoma there's no wonder if a retinal uh, optic disc hemorrhage is associated with this uh, damage the other signs uh, is the peripapillary pigment disturbances which uh, as i said uh, is the zone beta and zone alpha the wider the zone beta just adjacent to the disc margin the the faster is the progression of the glaucoma disease in that particular eye in ocular hypertensive patients where we may think of the progression of the disease in, in spite of the normal iops absence of the peripapillary atrophy can uh, uh, guide us that there is decreased chance of glaucoma in such patient and then reversal of cupping the axon loss is irreversible we know but reversal of cupping can happen only in the earliest of life where the sclera is elastic so any high iop at that point of time if it is controlled within the particular time then there is chances that the uh, cupping will reverse and it is only a mechanical effect and not because of addition of the neuronal tissue at that point and disc damage likelihood scale the ddls it was uh, put forth by spade and coworkers in which they have uh, staged the disease from 1 to 10 one being the less uh, risk of glaucoma and 10 with the highest risk of glaucoma here they have considered the size of the disc as small average and large if we take the example of the average disc 1.52 mm there they will they have mentioned uh, to consider the rim to disc ratio which is mentioned as 0.4 or uh, even less like see here the the nrr thickness is decreasing with the staging and at one point the rim loss is full which means the ratio is zero at this point they they suggest to know the extension of this uh, nrr loss and accordingly it is graded so uh, this will be helpful in processing a graph like at the initial presentation how much is the score as the disease i mean in the follow up time how much is the uh, how uh, how is the staging so that we can assess the uh progression of the disease thus we can modify the treatment or we can interfere with the surgery so here the progression is faster whereas in other case the progression is slower uh, the differential diagnosis of glaucoma is optic atrophy it can be normal variations or developmental anomalies or non glaucomatous coming to the normal variations it can it's mostly physiological cupping 
which can be observed in uh, moderate myopes also. So in these cases, we have to, where, whenever there is a suspicion, we have to examine both the eyes and then only we have to come to a conclusion. So the vertical cup disc ratio we have to examine, the size of the disc, and then how is the neuroretinal ring. Here, if you can see, the, it follows the, it follows the ISNT rule. The inferior rim is thicker, followed superior, then nasal temporal, and the other eye also follows the same. Only because of the anisometropia also, the size of the disc may appear larger on one side. Other development anomalies are optic nerve coloboma, in which, if you see, there is an excavation of the cup mostly inferotemporally, and the uh, disc also will be very large. There can be associated congenital anomalies like iris coloboma or uh, retinal choroidal coloboma along with it. And uh, other uh, differential diagnosis is morning glory anomalies, where the there is excavation of the posterior fundus, and this disc appears to be present in that excavation, and there is central glial tissue there. And in this one, like a morning glory, the uh, like a straight petals, we can see these uh, blood vessels are very straight, and then they are branching acutely. This uh, uh, these are helpful in differentiating from the glaucomates of. And other DD is the optic dispit, which is a shallow depression present on the temporal part of the neuroretinal rim. And um, this can be confused as a cup when it is present centrally. In these cases, an optic nerve head, um, sorry, an OCT of the optic nerve head will be useful. Uh, Dr. Rasekasar has shown us the OCT findings of the optic dispit previously, how it looks like. And when it is temporally, it may be associated with a CSCR. And then tilted disc. These tilted discs are seen mainly in high myopes where the refractive status of the patient will give us some idea and then the vision of the patient and then if we see the discs are tilted uh, where the temporal of the disc is elevated more and the infronasal part is uh, shifted posteriorly where there is oblique insertion of the optic nerves and the corresponding infronasal part of the retina will be hypopigmented in this case. Uh, uh, in that way, we can differentiate it. And the other DD is a megalopapillae, where uh, the discs are large in both the eyes. The cups are also large in both the eyes, and it follows ISNT. And uh, the IOP is normal in most of these patients. And uh, the non globomatous optic atrophy, um, which mostly we encounter, are the AOL or the neurological uh, diseases, where the paler will be more than the cupping. The IOP may be normal. Visual field effects usually uh, respect the mid, uh, vertical midline. And uh, color vision and uh, will be defective in such cases. In that way, we can differentiate the, the other uh, uh, DDs. These are my references. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vishnu. Today, we have a very good webinar presented show, and I'm ha happy to see Dr. Satyan here on the participants today. Hey. I know Dr. Satyan is a, one of the very senior glaucoma consultant, one of my colleagues in the Arvind and he's a glaucoma associate of India. And I would like uh, Dr. Satyan to add some more comments because there are a lot of post candidates and the junior consultants are there in the group today. So I want Dr. Satyan to just come in and add some few more uh, points for their benefit. Dr. Satyan, add some points, sir. Yeah, I'll, I'm... Uh, mm. Dr. Satyan, sir? Yeah, yeah, I'm just checking how to come in. Oh, just, just speak on, sir. Okay, it's already on? Yes, sir. Yeah, you're unmuted and you can okay, just speak okay. on. Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate Vishnu for taking up this uh, particular topic. And I also want to congratulate the, the whole team at uh, uh, Field Houses Hospital. <laughs> uh, good job at this lockdown time. So the idea is uh, whatever the Vishnu's uh, topic is on uh, how to really look at the optic disc in glaucoma. And uh, of course, he has covered the uh, basics in uh, glaucoma. I, I feel 
this once you have understood these basic points then uh, we can go to the next level because now uh, if you if you really have not understood these basics going to the next level may not be really very useful uh, having said that vishnu's uh, photographs are really fantastic vishnu is that uh, it's taken yeah. from uh, Modern eye hospital photos from the DRS, or it is from uh, Arvind. So text, text text or is it from the books? Yes, sir, books. Sir. Okay, <laughs> okay, Vishnu. Now I think you have a fantastic uh, fundus photos from the DRS. You yes, can um, take it from uh, Dr. Uh, P. L. Rao, yes, and then you can do the presentation. What, what I am trying to say is uh, anything original. We will uh, really start uh, appreciating more and more. Yes, sir. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Sir, would so, you like to ask your... some questions, sir, Dr. Satyan, sir? Which one? Yeah, I, I will just uh, read out the questions. Would you like to yeah, answer yeah, them? Yeah, yeah, please, 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 yeah. Please, I'll just read one question. This is from Dr. Gopal yeah. Lajgaru, Chairman Scientific Company from uh, Andhra Pradesh Hospital Society. Uh, okay. He, asked, he wants to know that clinically how to detect the progression of the disc during the follow up period if the progression is very minimal. Okay, okay. It's a, it's a very good question, in fact. Uh, what uh, I would advise is, uh, if you really want to pick up the early progression, then the only option you have is going in for the CT. You, you may not be able to really pick up from the, the fundus photographs or uh, from the visual fields. Visual fields really may not show very minimal uh, changes. The only option you have is either you can go for the was it or you have to look at the electrophysiology where we can find out whether the cells are going in for uh, damage or not any, uh, any any change in the size of the beta zone will help you clinically on the set lab uh, so that that's not really an early change what we are looking at once you see a visible change uh, from the fundus photograph then that is an obvious change that's not a too early change. That's what I was trying to say. So another question you can, is, you can still pick up. You can still yeah. pick up from the the notch increase in the notch size or NFL loss, but the beta zone is not the good indicator for uh, uh, the. Okay. Yeah. So another question from Dr. Raju is: Sometimes the CD yeah. ratio or the size of the cup varies between our 78D lens and the slit lamp appearance. And the fundus disc photographs. Why is it like that? And what is your opinion on that? Yeah, most of us used to use, at least when I was at Arvind, initial period, I used to use uh, 78 adapter. And then we all uh, switched on to 90D. Though there are uh, so many theoretical versions that, uh, okay, you convert that 1.1x or 2x or whatever the amount is. Uh, uh, the the inter observer variability is uh, pretty high, or uh, even the intra observer variability is also high. The only good indicator for you is having a good fundus photograph. On every follow up visit, you see the fundus photograph. Not saying that say 15 days post of I mean uh, post medication the patient comes, it doesn't mean that I'm going to say that you take another fundus photograph. It is not like that. Uh, but uh, just by looking at the 78 or 90. If you can pick up all the findings, that's a great job that you are doing. Uh, <clears throat> but if it is um, different lenses, I can't understand how much the uh, correction values that you have to give. And then uh, are we going to really change that? I don't know. At least uh, in this uh, 29, 30 years of our practice, I don't think I've done any changes according to that. Yeah. What you need sir. is what you see, you draw it. Yeah, yeah. Sir, another question is, from another doctor, yeah. any case of splinter hemorrhage, do you think glaucoma yeah. is the first thing you have to think of? That was the question, sir. Uh, absolutely no. Yeah. So first is always you ask for the history, what the patient has, especially the younger ones. If they have a, a, a disc hemorrhage close to the, or the peripapillary area, uh, we need to look at the valsalvas, or the young ones with the hypertensive uh, patients, or especially the malignant hypertension, 
or the intracranial, uh, higher intracranial pressures, uh, uh, injuries, those things has to be, or the renal diseases, especially the malignant hypertension uh, coming from the kidney problems. Especially if you look at the Kerala, they have a congenital kidney problems. Those areas we have to be polycystic kidney disease. So this okay. you have to have in mind before we go in for uh, or any yeah. blood disclosures the patient has. So these things has to be kept in mind before we go in for the either an NTG or an OST, all this. So another question, sir. What is the percentage yeah. of normal discs which will not follow the classical IS, ISNT rule? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it is like uh, how we talk about the US statistics for me. Okay. COVID <laughs> statistics from different places, how they, it has been projected. It is something similar to that for me. But every individual, what you need to see is how healthy is the neuroretinal rim than looking at the whether is it following the ESNT rule or is it not following the ESNT rule. If you're going to say 70% follows and 30% doesn't follow, and you are seeing a patient with not following any control, are we going to suspect this patient to have a glaucoma? It is not true. So what you really need to look at is look at the neuroretinal rim and look at the RNFL in that area. Whether that RNFL has a corresponding defect in the neuroretinal rim is the matter. So otherwise, I really don't give any importance to the neuroretinal, uh, I mean, the control. If you, if you really look at the whole concept of glaucoma, the cup itself is a, uh, just an imagination for us. So another question is, why is only nationalization of the vessels occurs? Why not be temporalization? Why don't we see the temporalization of vessels? That's a normal uh, anatomical presentation. It is something similar to the situs uh, inverses something similar to that. That's the normal version that how the appearance of the vessels itself is from the disc, how it comes out. So that, that's quite normal actually. Yeah. How to differentiate the inferiorly placed cup from the glaucomatous cup? Always look at the neuro, I mean, uh, the RNFL loss. RNFL, RNFL loss is going to tell you whether the patient has a notching and the RNFL loss is going to be the main thing for you to differentiate between the uh, glaucomatous changes and the normal ones. Sir, how to assess the cupping in a tilted disc? That's another question. The tilted disc syndrome, yeah. Okay, once you have a spectralis, then you are done. Okay. <laughs> the, the spectralis OCT. The whole concept of glaucoma, I, I feel ashamed actually. I don't uh, feel... Uh, very comfortable to say that, but uh, I feel ashamed to say that whatever we were uh, looking at the optic disc, RNFL changes, or um, the cupping, whatever you call it as, is uh, uh, completely off when you really look at the spectralis OCT with the premium edition of uh, the glaucoma uh, diagnosis. So, it, it's completely different from what we are looking at it. What we talk about is now the minimum rim width and what is the true optic nerve head. So that's what we need to talk more and more. So probably we can have those lectures uh, uh, a little later. Because uh, uh, Vishnu's topic is very important. Understanding the anatomy is essential. So once you got this point, then once you move on to that level, then you will have a different concept altogether. Is it okay, sir, if I ask a few more questions or... Uh, yeah, yeah, please, please go ahead. I'm jobless. I'm bothering yeah. you. I'm not bothering you, sir. Absolutely no, no, no. Please go ahead. When a senior cousin like you on the panel, I think there's always nice to have you uh, to answer a few questions for the post benefits, sir. Please. Yeah, yeah, please, 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 please ask. Okay, sir. Yeah. So there's another question. How to diagnose a suspect glaucoma in high myopic patients? Like uh, the, my answer to that again is once you do the spectralis OCT, then it is easy for us to understand where we are drawing the optic nerve head. And also we will be able to draw the, the minimum rim width. How much is the tilt? 
and what is the temporal means macula is not always a uh, little over from the temporal area it can be straight it can be little up so it's highly variable so whatever we are looking at from the uh, oct is not the true ones so that's why i am really impressed with the spectralis oct how it gives you exactly whether it, even if you have the high myopia we can still understand whether this patient has a glaucomatous or non glaucomatous that's absolutely we can do that so another case scenario given by one doctor he says the office iop being 22 mm of mercury and the disc of the, the same eye having a 0.2 dap two uh, cupris ratios more than the normal the eye left eye the cup of the right eye is shallow it's not deep do you call it as a glaucoma suspect or uh, do you call it as a uh, glaucoma case <laughs> okay uh, it's very simple to answer for this yeah. uh, we every one of us know that it is our uh, subjective uh, variation in looking at the optic disc so unless you have the fundus photography both eyes together that's the critical point that's why i keep on telling everyone please take the fundus photography before you say whether the patient has a glaucoma change or not the idea is many of the patients will have a asymmetric size of the disc that is one thing and asymmetric shape of the disc we need to give lot of importance it is not only the size we need to give importance for the shape of the disc so according to the shape of the disc some may have a yeah, cupping uh, i mean many of them will have the cupping according to the shape of the disc it is not only the size of the disc the shape of the disc also the cup will be similar to that so sometimes we may misunderstand that as a glaucomatous uh, cupping so please focus on the shape and also the rnfl and corresponding cup don't look at the cup straight away and then look at saying that okay this glaucomatous or non glaucomatous never do that always look at the rnfl and also look at the shape and compare it both eyes together that's where your fundus photograph really helps so we have few questions on ntg normal tension glaucoma yeah what yeah, all patients we need to do when we suspect ntg uh can you just repeat once more the additional investigations apart from our routine glaucoma additional investigations okay yeah. so okay. once you are trying to diagnose a disease of ntg below the age of 40 uh that means you are missing out uh, truly something more of a neurological disease that is one thing and if it is more than the age of uh, 40 years and you are picking up the ntg then always look at the visual fields visual fields will give us a lot of idea because more closer to the central 10 degrees defect you may not really see a huge defect but once it is within the central 10 degrees of the defect then it is more of a ntg that gives you a lot of uh, idea that is one part and uh, second thing is you may look at the diurnal uh, variation to see whether you are really treating the ntg or you are treating the false ntg that is uh, poag as such third part is looking at the disc hemorrhages it is not necessarily that everybody has to have the disc hemorrhage in normal tension glaucoma that is the third part then fourth is like um, you have the uh, ocular perfusion pressures which i really don't believe nowadays it is not giving you the exact uh, things so i would go for more of a systemic evaluation like uh, cardiovascular and the carotid evaluation and another area of interest is the sleep apnea study many of them may have the sleep apnea disease where the disease has a significant amount of progression that has been proved beyond doubt so sleep apnea is the question that you need to ask as well as you need to kind of um, uh, really evaluate ask the history that is pretty easy to ask the history you just explain how the sleep apnea will sound tell the attender to notice that and then if they go to the pulmonal i mean uh, the sleep therapist they will uh, literally advise you to uh, you know hello yeah please yeah that's yeah. it yeah 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 uh, okay. they will really they'll really advise you to 
either a CPAP or whatever the treatment that can give you, that will significantly improve the glaucoma status as well. So basically, we need to understand the family also, whether the whole family, then taking the uh, blood pressure is again uh, very important. Many of them may have a very low uh, diastolic as well as the systolic pressures that is a lot low BP levels. Those are, are also the patients. And some of them are genetically prone to have. We have at least five or six families with a very low uh, IOPs in spite of that, uh, both parents and uh, three of the children, all in uh, you know 30s, early 30s. They all have the disease with 0 0.8, 0 0.9 CD ratio with the corresponding uh, visual field changes. But they have a very slow progression. But again, it is uh, completely genetically predisposed also. Yeah. So there's another question. Uh, yeah. Apart from RNLF defects, how will we differentiate yes. glaucomatous and primary optic atrophy disease? Uh, I think it is very straightforward answer to that is uh, yeah. primary optic atrophy. You have the neuroretinal rim pallor. We are not looking at the cupping as such. So it is a very straightforward uh, answer because uh, RNFL is not going... Yeah, the RNFL also will have a thinning in, uh, 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 you know, like a primary optic atrophy also. So the OCT can give you some idea where the RNFL changes are. So you have the, something called as a insight in a spectralis where it can really pick up the uh, glaucoma versus the neurological diseases. Insight is a software. So for the participants, I'm I'm just uh, um, missing few questions because I don't want yeah, to repeat. Yeah. Myself. I don't want him to repeat the answers. I'm just uh, uh, just uh, segregating the questions rather. Okay. So another question is the significance of ophthalmic artery Doppler, Doppler in diagnosing glaucoma, especially pre-perimetric glaucoma. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I used to do that, but now I have completely stopped it because you need to have uh, the Doppler person, whoever is doing it, need to understand it very well. And also the repeatability part is uh, pretty poor. So that is one of the reasons why I completely stopped doing the color Doppler itself. So another question is, what are the recent modalities in assessment of the optic nerve head? Apart from the routine, uh, the, he wants to know about the OCT maybe. The classical pictures of the OCT and optic head changes, glaucoma. Okay. So most of the uh, glaucoma uh, diagnostics is going towards the, the minimum rim width and also on the ganglion cell layer uh, analysis, especially with the higher end OCTs, you can see the, the panomap of uh, Zeiss and of course the spectralis also gives a fantastic uh, map of the GCL. The asymmetry that is the superior and inferior asymmetry plays a very critical role in the macular area of the GCL plays a very critical role in understanding the early disease. And uh, the other important point which I would like to mention here is doing the visual fields if you are really looking at the very early glaucoma is if you are or 24-2, you are not going to pick up the LED, LED disease. You need to do your 10-2 because the GCL is the one thing which gets affected much earlier. And you do the 10-2, then probably you may pick up the early glaucomas. So it is a completely different concept. The traditional uh, teaching is you do the 10-2 in the terminal glaucoma. It is not so. You need to do the 10-2 for the very early glaucomas. And of course, uh, as mentioned earlier, we need to do it in the very advanced glaucomas because otherwise we cannot see how much is the progression happening. Yeah. So, so one question is from Dr. Praveena. Why temporal yeah. nerve fibers are more susceptible to glaucomatous damage when compared to nasal fibers? And why the macular fibers are resistant to glaucomatous damage? Uh, that is uh, very important, actually. Yeah, if you if you really look at the uh, the laminar arrangement, then you will be able to. The, the, it is basically the anatomical arrangement of the axons, how it has been arranged, and the laminar pores, how it has been arranged. That is one of the main reasons why in glaucoma the mechanical pressure damages, especially the more the superior and the inferior axons, axonal fibers, than 
the temporal fibers, actual temporal fibers, and also the nasal fibers. It doesn't mean that nasal fibers are not getting damaged. It does get damaged. But only thing is because the laminar arrangement and how the axons enters, then we can easily, I mean, it's easily understandable that why the temporal fibers get affected. Uh, there's a question from uh, Dr. Rajshekhar, our retina surgeon here. So it is yeah. not a clinical uh, question, but it's a, he wants to know uh, how to avoid the silicon oil induced secondary glaucoma for VR surgeons. <laughs> <laughs> that you should be able to answer. <laughs> anyway, I, I think there are uh, different uh, companies that give us silicon oils. So the, the problem is how much you put the silicon oil and when do you want to remove the silicon oil? and additional procedures how much you do and how much of the damage or uh, how long the surgery is taking place what are the other associated complications that the patient has like a residual vitreous hemorrhage or the shallowing of the chambers or uh, there are multiple reasons it is not a single entity it is not only the silicon oil plays a role and how much is the trabecular uh, measure functioning uh, uh, previously to the uh, before the surgery itself so it, it is not only the open angle glaucoma in that in these patients probably the associated uh, creeping angle closure which is also been missed in these patients can also cause and the other factor is the lens also becomes a little thicker you might have in, uh, inadvertently touched the lens during the retinal procedures which could also have uh, caused increase in the lens thickness which is again will push the lens iris drive from forward slowly, which will again cause the creeping uh, angle closures, which we really don't put cornioscopy in these eyes. It's not only the silicon oil which occludes the trabecular meshwork, it's the inflammatory reaction, it is the fibrinoid reaction, or it could be the blood cells which is uh, going and obstructing the trabecular meshwork, or it is the scar tissue over a period of time, or it could be the injections associated uh, even along with this or uh, the amount of silicon oil which has been injected. So everything plays a role. It is not is a single factor. Sir, is macular OCT is significant in glaucoma? If yes, at what stage you want to do macular OCT? Macular OCT, yes, absolutely. Because now we are looking at the GCL as the uh, very early glaucoma. The GCL is the one thing which we really look at. So definitely it plays a role. I'm not sure whether the previous was it is the one which I have previously, though it is very advanced, which has a microperimetry also, it doesn't do the GCL. But if you have the GCL, then we need to understand the superior and inferior asymmetry is much more important than the nasal and uh, temporal asymmetry. And also how the panel map is. So the, the, how, how things are arranged, that's the key factor in this. So why I'm, I'm saying these temporal fibers are very critical is what we see in our regular OCT, the temporal fibers, is not the true temporal fibers. Because there is always a tilt when you do the OCT in our patients. But what we really see in the temporal fibers is not the true temporal fibers that we need to understand. So another interesting question is, if we have an inferior yeah. notching present, which nerve mm -hmm. fibers are primarily affected? The one near the optic disc or the near the horizontal rafe? Inferior temporal means it is inferior temporal. Why there is a horizontal rafe which we are looking at? This is closer to the disc. The fibers coming from the closer to the disc are from the periphery. That's what the question means. So we have to really look at the OCT picture where exactly is the r uh, changes is happening. Mm -hmm. If it is horizontal rafe, that is the temporal fibers, true temporal fibers or the papilla macular bundle, then you just look at it. It is uh, nothing like where exactly is the, it, it is not a very generalized term we can call it as. So how do you compare the OCT angio and OCT measurements in diagnosing glaucoma? Does OCT uh, angio have specific significance? If you, if you really want to ask me an uh, extremely modified answer for that is, it is under evolution. Okay. <laughs> Evaluation and uh, evolution, both. Hello.
हेलो हेलो थैंक यू सेक्शन थैंक यू सेक्शन फॉर ऑल द आंसर्स आई थिंक यू स्पेंड अ लॉन्ग टाइम लॉन्ग टाइम आंसरिंग ऑल द क्वेश्चंस थैंक यू वेरी मच ओके आई थॉट इन अगेन फ्रॉम ग्लोकोमा सोसाइटी या या इट्स बीन अ रियली लॉन्ग टाइम दैट आई हैव सीन यू गोपाल कृष्णन एंड ऑल द होल एंटायर टीम आई रियली वांटेड टू कंग्रेचुलेट यू and i'm really happy that i could be in the academic uh, forum to answer few of the, your questions thank you so much thank you thank you i want to explore your expertise on this uh, webinar thank you very much for your participation vishnu and the one want... uh, the zoom which you have selected is i think uh, where more than 100 people can uh, i think participate in this is no, that I correct think, uh, youtube also sir yeah, yeah because you can it is showing we can record and also yeah. it's live in the youtube so i think it is more than 100 people can attend this session yes sir now more than 100 people yeah, we have around 130 registered um, at the peak hours yeah wonderful thank okay. you great Thanks. great going okay if you want to add some more on the doubts uh, nothing sir nothing sir yeah, thank you so dr dr thank gopal you. thank you vishnu sir thank dr. you much sir dr gopal here on the uh, panel today so dr raju wants to make some announcement here regarding a webinar from aps voice dr raju please dr gopal raju garu yeah uh, thank you uh, uh, gopal can you hear me yes sir please carry on sir yeah on behalf of the apos uh, i'm happy to announce that this saturday morning 11 o'clock we are conducting the uh, panel discussion on the uh, the lockdown and then covid 19 how one should uh, take care of your organization right from the patient care to the maintenance of the infrastructure and also the staff and the future of the camp setups including all the aspects of our practice there will be a panel discussion between 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock i invite all of you please participate we will be sending you the link through zoom so please uh, keep that time allotted for our discussion and then lot of uh, the, the questions uh, we uh, we actually encourage a lot of discussion on that so please see the uh, block your uh, time and date at that time thank you thank you gopal thank you sir thank you very much so we come to the end of the program so i remind you tomorrow also we have a session at 5:30 the same time on the zoom so tomorrow's topic is on the carnal topic and uh, and i remind you on the 11th uh, saturday of this week between 11 to 1 pm one noon the ap ophthalmic society has got a webinar on the covid and post covid hospital management please do attend Thank you all for participating in this webinar. We are signing off. Have a great night.